أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أب القاسم المصطفى محمد صلي على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليه صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأقم الصلاة طرفي النهار وزلفا من الليل إن الحسنات يذهبن السيئات ذلك ذكرى للذاكرين صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Another salawat for the love of the Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam. A third salawat for the love of Aba Abdullah with your loudest voices. One of the greatest dangers that any human can fall in is a lifestyle of disobedience, a lifestyle of sin, where it becomes a habit to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to transgress the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this will have a negative effect on a person's life, it will have a negative effect on a person's relationship with Allah and his or her relationship with other people because the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know most of them, they do not have to do necessarily with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah says do not lie, this is for the well-being of society. When Allah says do not cheat, do not steal, do not abuse, do not backbite. These are all for the well-being of society. So when we live a sinful lifestyle, we are in fact turning against one another. And this is one of the greatest disasters that can happen to any single one of us. And it has many negative effects. Allah says in the Quran, كَلَّا بَرَّانَ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ مَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ Every time you disobey Allah, there's going to be a dot on your heart. There's going to be a blackness on your heart. Not literally, but we can, if we want something to compare it to, today doctors will tell you about cholesterol. When you eat food that has a lot of oil in it, you're going to block the arteries in your heart. 
One day, two days, one year, two years, three years, eventually the heart, the doctors will tell you you need a heart transplant. This heart is no good. You can't use this heart anymore. This heart will not function. The Quran tells us that sin does the same thing towards the spiritual heart. Their actions, it places a dot on their heart, a filth on their heart that eventually it will consume the whole heart and eventually the heart will be away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What happens when my heart is completely filthy? Amir al-Mu'mineen tells us in Dua Kumail, he says, Allahumma khfir li al-dhunub al-lati tahtikul asam. There are sins that will break the purity and the protection that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created me with. Allah created me as a pure person. Allah created us all as ma'soom. But there are sins that break that purity. Allahumma khfir li al-dhunub al-lati تهتك العصم اللهم اغفر لي الذنوب التي تنزل النقم There are sins The effect of that sin I may not see it Because I'm living a lifestyle of bad habits I don't see it But there are sins that bring the bala There are sins that bring the niqam The wrath of Allah And the punishment of Allah Upon me and upon society around me اللهم اغفر لي الذنوب التي تغير النعم الله سبحانه وتعالى has blessed me but sometimes that blessing it can turn into a bala and we've seen that happen we all want money we consider money to be a blessing but if I live a lifestyle of sinning and disobeying Allah what does that money become? that money becomes a source a way for me to turn against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a na'mah. But if I'm living a sinful lifestyle, it becomes a na'mah. We want children. We ask Allah for children. This is a na'mah. It's a blessing. But if I do not raise my children the right way, my children will become a na'mah upon me. They will become something that Allah will ask me about on the day of judgment. Why did you not raise your children the right way? Why are your children not praying? Why are your children, why do they not have a connection with their Lord and their Creator? This is a question that we all have to ask ourselves. Allahumma khfir li ad-dhunub al-lati tunzilu al-bala. Allahumma khfir li ad-dhunub al-lati tahbisu al-dua. When I live a sinful lifestyle, my dua will not be accepted anymore. My du'a will not even be able to penetrate the walls, the ceiling, let alone reach the skies and the heavens. This is the effect of sin. And therefore, we need to repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and get out of that lifestyle, get out of those bad habits that we have confined ourselves to. You know sins? It's chains that are holding me on. They're not allowing me to be free. They're not allowing me to be liberated so that I can speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if I cannot speak to Allah, if my dua is not accepted, then this is the worst bala upon any single person. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, out of His mercy, out of His compassion, we have a merciful Lord. We have a Rabbun Ghafoor, Rabbun Rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to call him through his rahmah. He has 99 names. But Allah says, when you say, when you recite the Quran, start with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Always remember the mercy of Allah. And these are two words from the same root, from the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened the doors of repentance. Allah has promised to forgive us all. Anyone who commits any sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises 
to forgive them. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَخْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا You know how beautiful this verse is? Tell my ibad, tell my servants, the ones who have oppressed themselves, الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ because when we disobey Allah, we're not doing anything to harm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not hurting Allah. Asrafu ala anfusihim. We hurt ourselves. La taqnatu min rahmatillah. Do not ever give up hope in the mercy of Allah. Inna Allah yaghfiru al-dhunuba jami'a. Allah forgives all of the sins. Where do you find someone that promises to forgive all of the sins? You know how compassionate some parents are with their children? But there is a time where the parents will shut the door in their children's face. They will tell them, go. You have hurt me too much. I cannot forgive you. There are times where couples, they do not forgive one another. But Allah says, Inna Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'a. Allah forgives all of the sins. In another verse, Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ The ones who have done a fahisha, they have done a great sin. أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ Once again, they have oppressed themselves. ذَكَرُوا اللَّهِ They remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ They asked Allah to forgive them for their sins. And then Allah says, وَمَنْ يَخْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Who else can they turn to other than Allah? Can I turn to someone else and ask that person to forgive me? It is only Allah that will forgive. It is only Allah that I can turn to. There is only one sin that Allah does not forgive. And that is associating a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Other than that, Allah forgives all of these sins. Now someone might ask, why does, why does Allah not forgive for a mushrik? Why does Allah not forgive someone who associates a partner with him? The answer is clear. Because when someone is associating a partner with Allah, this person is cutting off the bond with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a connection that I have with my Lord. But when I believe that someone else can forgive me, someone else is a God, I give someone else who is a creator godly attributes, then that means I'm not acknowledging the fact that Allah forgives the sins. Other than that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives all of the sins. Now, there are ways Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful that He has not made it just one way that we can seek salvation. There are different ways where we can reach the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the salvation of Allah. And these are mentioned in the Quran. I will mention five ways where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised to forgive for the one who performs that act. The first, Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيِّئَاتِ The good deed, it removes, it erases the bad deed. And there's a story why this verse came down. One day a man came to Rasulullah, a young man. He had just prayed in the masjid of Rasulullah and he came crying to Rasulullah. He told him, Oh Rasulullah, I am feeling the shame. I'm feeling the guilt. I have done something very wrong. And I want to see if Allah will forgive me. Rasulullah told him, what did you do? He said, I have a store in the market that I sell dates. See, that time, dates was the, you know, the seized candy, the chocolate of the time. So he says, I sell dates. And one day, a lady, a beautiful lady, she came to the store and she wanted to buy dates. So I saw that she was very beautiful. I gave her the expensive dates for the money that she was giving. She had less money, but I gave her the better one. And then I also went and I kissed her. 
And now I realize that she has a husband and she and I feel the regret, I feel the remorse. And this is why it's not a good idea to just randomly kiss someone because you don't know what this person, you know, the story, and you can't just go and kiss someone. So this man, he tells Rasulullah, I am feeling the shame. I'm feeling the guilt. She has a husband, he was away. Rasulullah told him, he told Rasulullah, will Allah forgive me? Rasulullah told him, were you praying with us? He said, yes, I was praying. I pray here every day. I come and I pray jama'ah at the masjid. Rasulullah, he waited for a moment until Jibra'il came down with this verse in the Quran. وَأَقِمَ الصَّلَاةَ طَرَفَيْنْ طَرَفَيْنْ نَهَارْ وَزُلَفًا مِنَ اللَّيْلِ إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيَّعَاتِ Allah told him, pray in the morning and at night. As long as you pray all day, you have hasanat, you do good deeds, that good deed, it will erase the bad deed that you commit during the day. And this is the beauty of prayer, my dear brothers and sisters. This is the beauty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to speak to Him five times a day. Some people say, why do I need to speak to Allah five times a day? That's too much. I don't even talk to my parents five times a day. I don't talk to the closest people. Some husbands, they say, I don't even talk to my wife. Once a day or twice a day. Now, coming and talking to Allah five times a day? Yes, we connect with Allah five times a day. Because that is a form of purification. Allah says, وَأَقِنَ الصَّلَاةَ طَرَفَيْنْ نَهَارْ وَزُلَفًا مِنَ اللَّيْلِ When you pray, you are constantly going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though you sinned, even though you disobeyed Allah during the day, but then when you go back to prayer, you say, Astaghfirullah. You go back, you build a bond with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is a form of hasana, and that will repel you from sin. Because in essence, a salah, it's supposed to, inna salata tanha anil fahsha'i wal munkar. Prayer, it removes the fahsha and the munkar from our lives. So if I live a life where I'm constantly praying and I value that prayer and I respect that prayer, prayer eventually it's supposed to stop me from sinning and stop me from disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is first. إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيَّعَاتِ The good deed, it removes the bad deed. Just like when you are washing your face five times a day and Rasulullah he gave the Muslims this example. They told him, why do we have to pray five times a day? He said, imagine someone who has a river next to his house. At that time, they didn't have access to showers. They didn't have that easy access. He says, imagine if someone has a river next to his house. He goes and he dips himself in that river five times a day. How clean will this person be? This person will be extremely clean. He said, prayer does the same thing. It purifies you. Every time you are going to be led away from Allah, prayer is what purifies you. This is the first. The good deeds, and specifically prayer, it is a form of kafara. It is a form of purification from sin. The second is to stay away from the greater sins. The sins... They're not all at one level. In the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are some sins that are greater than other sins. For example, Allah says, if someone killed, this person will be punished and this person will have adab, nar jahannam, for someone who killed. But Allah is not going to punish someone who committed a minor sin, someone who forgot it was an accident, he accidentally did something wrong, one of the Sagira, Allah is not going to punish him the same way that he punishes someone who has killed or who has done one of the kaba'ir. So Allah says in the Quran, in tajtanibu kaba'ira ma tunhawna an nukaffir ankum sayyatikum. If you stay away from the greater sins, 
then we will forgive your minor sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as long as you live a life of obedience, you're not committing the greater sins. Now, someone might ask, what's a kabira and what's a sahira? What's a small sin and what's a great sin? Scholars have answered this in two ways, and there's two ways to look at it. They have numbered a group of sins, some sins as the kaba'ir. For example, killing, adultery, even some, some sins that we might look at them as very small sins. For example, backbiting, ghibah, it's considered as one of the kaba'ir. But then there's other one, for example, by accident, you look at something haram, you did something, you listened to something haram by accident, one time it was a slip of a tongue, this is considered a sahira. And then there's another approach. Some scholars, they say, no, any sin. And of course, there's a hadith that, that justifies this and speaks about this. The, the hadith says that any sin, any sin, you should not look at the sin that you are committing. You should look at who you are disobeying. You should look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So a small sin is a sin that is committed by accident. You did not do it on purpose. Someone might say, yes, since there, this is considered a small sin, then let me do this every day on purpose. No. لا إصرار في الصغيرة. If someone continues to perform and commit the small sin, it will turn into a greater sin. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive for that sin. But Allah says, in تَجْتَنِبُوا كَبَائِرَ مَا تُنْهَوْنَ عَنْهُ نُكَفِّرْ عَنْكُمْ سَيَّآتِكُمْ We will forgive the unintentional sins. The sins that you did not commit on purpose. This is the second. The third means of forgiveness is Tawbah. Tawbah is a feeling in the heart. Tawbah is the feeling of remorse. The feeling of regret that every single sinner feels after they have committed a sin. And this is in the Quran, Allah speaks about the nafs al-lawamah. La uqsimu bi yawm al-qiyamah. وَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِالنَّفْسِ There's a part of every single one of us, whenever we have done something wrong, we feel the shame and we feel the guilt. And that is the gravity that pulls us back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the tawbah. Of course, everyone feels that. But the tawbah is the one who actually feels the remorse and decides on not Committing that sin once again. This is Tawbah. And the beautiful thing of Tawbah is that it doesn't require anything. There's only one condition for Tawbah. You don't need to be in a state of wudu. You don't need to be in the masjid. You don't need to be sitting in a specific way. You could be sleeping. You could be on your bed. You could be driving. As long as you feel that regret and that shame and that guilt and you decide on not Going back to that sin, that is tawbah. You see all of the other ibadat, for example, prayer, you have to go and do wudu, hajj, you have to travel, psalm, you have fasting, you have to refrain from eating, zakat, you have to come and give money, jihad, you have to go and do, you have to practice. But tawbah does not require any movement. It does not require anything extra. And this is the beauty of Allah's mercy, Allah is so merciful that He says you don't need to do much. All you do is have that feeling of regret and feeling of shame and guilt for the sins that you have committed, but it has one condition. And that is, you have to be sincere. And how many of us are sincere with ourselves? How many of us are honest with ourselves? Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu Tubu ila Allah tawbatan nasuha. Return to Allah. Do tawbah. However, let your tawbah be nasuha. Let it be a sincere tawbah. Maybe we could fool other people. Maybe we could tell other people that I won't do something and then I go and do it behind their back. 
But is there a running away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is there a place that I can go and hide where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not see me? وَلَا يُمْكِنُ الْفِرَارُ مِنْ حُكُومَتِكَ There is no escape from the government of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Tawbah is for the ones who are sincere. And this is why we go once again to Amir al-Mu'mineen. He speaks about how one should turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَقَدْ أَتَيْتُكَ يَا إِلَٰهِي بعد تقصيري وإسرافي على نفسي معتذرا نادما منكسرا مستقيلا مستغفرا منيبا مقرا مذعنا معترفا لا أجد مفرا مما كان مني ولا مفزعا أتوجه إليه في أمري غير قبولك عذري Oh Allah, I turn to you apologetic I turn to you with sincerity I turn to you with remorse I turn to you with guilt and shame for the crimes that I have committed upon myself. And I know that there is no other way. There is no other way. Who can I turn to and ask that person to forgive me other than you? This is the beauty of the Tawbah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the Tawbah of whoever asks him. إن الله يحب التوابين ويحب المتطهرين. الله loves. There's only a few times where Allah says Allah loves. Here Allah says إن الله يحب التوابين. Allah loves the ones who turn to Him and repent to Him. In one hadith, the hadith says كل أبناء آدم all of the children of Adam are sinners. There is no escape from sinning and disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, we have to try of course. But then Allah says the best of the ones who do tawbah, the best of the ones who sin are the ones who perform tawbah. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. In another hadith, the Imam says, In Allah Ta'ala ashaddu farahan bitawbati abdih min rajulun adalla rahilatuhu wa zaaduhu fi laylatin dalma' fawajadaha. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala welcomes the one who repents, the one who turns to him, and he is happy when someone says, Ya Allah, and turns to him. Just like Someone who loses all that he owns in the middle of the night and then he finds it before sunrise. How happy will this person be? Someone who lost all of that he owns and then he found it. This person will be so happy. The hadith says Allah is happier. Allah is happier. Of course, Allah does not have feelings like you and I. Allah's happiness means that Allah will accept that person's dua. Allah will accept that person's tawbah. This is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, tawbah has another condition. It does not have to do with Allah. Allah says, I will forgive you the sins that you have disobeyed me. But what about the ones who you have oppressed? What about the ones whom you have abused? What about the people that you have talked bad about and you have backbited against them? These people, you have to go and have them be satisfied with you. Allah says, with my part, I will forgive. But you need to have those people also be satisfied with you. This is why you can't have someone who steals, who cheats, who backbites. Their tongue is constantly backbiting. And then you see this person coming to the masjid and praying the best and most beautiful prayer. 
Yes, Allah says, with my part, I will forgive you. But you also need to go and make sure that these people are happy with you. These people are satisfied with you. What about the ones that you have oppressed? Allah does not like oppression. So this is also a condition for tawbah. And the fourth is istighfar. Now there's a difference between tawbah and istighfar. The tawbah is a feeling in the heart and a decision not to disobey Allah within ourselves. Istighfar is talabul maghfirah, seeking repentance, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. And this is also an act where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives for. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهِ They remembered Allah. Allah was on their mind. However, they asked Allah to forgive them. I cannot just, I should not just feel the shame and the remorse without asking Allah to forgive me, asking for the maghfirah, asking for the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the forgiveness of Allah. And of course, istighfar has a lot of blessings. Even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Rasulullah, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purified him. He used to say istighfar 100 times every day. Some Muslims, they came to Rasulullah and they told him, Why are you doing istighfar when Allah has purified you? You have no sins. He tells them, Should I not be a thankful servant? Should I not appreciate what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me? So asking for istighfar, it has a lot of blessings upon a person. And the hadith says that it is recommended to do istighfar 70 to 100 times every day. Now imagine if you are asking your friend, if you are asking your mother, your family member, your friend, your cousin, something 70 times every day. You keep telling this person, I want this, I want this, I want this, 70 times. Even someone who hates you, they will probably give it to you. <coughs> After asking them 70 times. Now imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we ask Allah 70 times, you think Allah will not forgive? This is why it is recommended to always ask. And we have sins. Rasulullah didn't have sins. But we have to do istighfar every day in our lives. And the fifth and the final that I will mention, a way of seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is through Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Through the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now here, probably a Wahhabi Someone who goes and shoots up people that are remembering the Ahlul Bayt just like today in Qatif. Someone walks in a majlis just like we are sitting today and he shoots people that are remembering Rasulullah and the family of Rasulullah. Now here this person might not agree, but we do not care because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has justified this act. In the Quran, Allah says, وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ إِذْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ جَاءُوكَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُ اللَّهِ وَاسْتَغْفَرَ لَهُمُ الرَّسُولِ لَوَجَدُ اللَّهَ تَوَّابًا رَحِيمًا For the ones who have oppressed themselves. They came to you, O Rasulullah, and next to you, O Rasulullah, they asked Allah to forgive them. And Rasulullah asked Allah to forgive them. لَوَجَدُ اللَّهَ تَوَّابًا رَحِيمًا They will see that Allah will forgive them. And this is what all of the Sahaba, the companions, the Tabi'een, they all used to do this. They all used to go to the grave of Rasulullah and ask for the intercession of Rasulullah until a man came 500 years ago by the name of Ibn Taymiyyah. He said, no, 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 don't visit Rasulullah. Breaking the Sunnah of Rasulullah and the Sunnah of the companions and the Tabi'een. He came and he wanted to add his own bid'ah, innovation to religion. 
You know what he said? He said it's haram to visit the grave of Rasulullah. And he wanted to destroy the grave of Rasulullah. And you know what the Muslims did at that time? It was not the Shias who were in power. They placed him in prison and he died in the prison in Damascus. But then, 300 years ago, a man by the name of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, he came and he gave life to that false bid'ah. He gave life to that bid'ah. And they went and they destroyed the graves of the Imams in Baqir. And they would have destroyed the grave of Rasulullah. But there's a secret to that. So we turn, we turn to the Imams. We turn to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi because Allah has allowed us to. And there's a hadith from Rasulullah. He says, he says, in my life, I will be a blessing for you. And in my death, I will also be a blessing for you. So they told him, oh Rasulullah, how are you a blessing? He told them, in my life, I'm a blessing because Allah says, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ وَأَنْتَ فِيهِمْ Allah does not bring the wrath and the punishment upon a group of people that within them is Rasulullah. And then he said, and in my death, I will see your a'mal. A'mali tu a'malukum tu'rad alayh. Your a'mal, your deeds, I will see them and I will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. This is the mercy of Rasulullah. Rasulullah was also a rahmah. Allah is merciful and Rasulullah, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً he is also a source of mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, we turn to Rasulullah, there's nothing wrong with that. And you know who else we turn to? We turn to Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. We turn to the Imam who Rasulullah said about him, Inna al Hussein, Misbah al Huda wa Safina al Najat. Hussein is the beacon of light and he is the ark of salvation. He will take people to paradise with him. Many years they come and they remember him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the love of Imam al Hussein, he will not allow the ones who shed tears for Aba Abdullah to be burned in the hellfire. This is why we turn to Imam al Hussein. And there are numerous hadith, many narrations. In one hadith, Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, Inna Allah awwad al Hussein alayhi salam min qatlih, anna al Imamah min dhurriyatih, wa al Shafa'ah min turbatih, wa ijabat al dua taht qubbatih. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored Imam al Hussein by giving him the Imams. The nine Imams, they are from the children of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. And the soil of the grave of Aba Abdullah, it has shifa, it has healing. Now someone might come and say, that doesn't make sense. How does dirt, how does soil have healing? Go and do some studying. Go and read. You will see that the medicine that we take every night before we sleep, they take it from this animal and that animal. Imagine, now that medicine that we are accepting, it's taken from animals. We take it without questioning. What about so a soil that is mixed with the purified blood of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam? And third, the dua is answered under the dome of Aba Abdullah. You know what the Imams used to do? The Imams from the children of Imam Al Hussein, Imam Zain Al Abideen, Imam Al Sadiq, Imam Al Hadi, they used to tell their companions. They would tell them, to the, I cannot go and visit Imam Al Hussein. I want you to go visit Imam Al Hussein and do dua for me under the dome of Imam Al Hussein. The companions, they would tell the Imam, but you are an Imam, you are Ma'soom. Allah answers your dua. He says, there are places that Allah likes to be asked. 
And this is why we turn to Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. Imam al Hussein, he is a source of mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is from the mercy of Allah. And this is why his whole mission, it was to save people. It was to bring people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He stood in Mecca and he asked people to join him. He asked people to join his caravan and be with him. He says, مَنْ لَحِقَ بِنَا استشهد. He who joins us, he will become a martyr. However, he who does not join us, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَلْحَقْ بِنَا لَمْ يُدْرَكِ الْفَتْحِ This person will not be successful. This person will not be victorious. Because according to Imam al Hussein, victory comes through shahada. On the 2nd of Muharram, we remember how Imam al Hussein arrived to Karbala. It was the day Imam al Hussein set foot to Karbala. But Imam al Hussein, before being in Karbala, he was in Hajj. He was performing the Hajj on the 8th of the Hajjah, the day of Tarwiyah, the day where all of the Hajjaj, they are going to Arafat, the caravans, they were flocking towards Arafat to perform the Hajj. There was one caravan that was leaving Mecca and headed towards Iraq. That caravan, it had the flag of Bani Hashim. They asked Imam al Hussein, why are you leaving? This is Hajj. It's wajib to perform the Hajj. Imam al Hussein's reply was that I have a greater Hajj to perform. The Hajjaj, they offer one sacrifice. They sacrifice a sheep in the way of Allah. I have a greater sacrifice to offer in the way of Allah. Hajj is one of the furu' al deen But when the whole religion, when the essence of religion is in danger by a man like Yazid, the sacrifice has to be the blood of Aba Abdullah. This is what the only thing that can save the religion of Islam. He gave and he announced to the world that he is leaving because he had heard and there was rumors and he had heard that the Yazid had sent someone to kill Imam al Hussein, assassinate Imam al Hussein, even if he is holding on to the sitar, to the drapes of the Kaaba. Yazid, he said, he sent 40 men to kill Imam al Hussein, even if he's holding on to the Kaaba. Imam al Hussein is doing tawaf. He heard a caller, Ya Hussein, Inju binafsik. فَإِنَّ يَزِيد قَدْ عَزِمَ عَلَىٰ قَتْلِكْ O oh, Hussein, leave Mecca, leave the sacred land because Yazid has, it's, he is going to kill you if you stay. Imam al Hussein he asked, مَنْ أَنْتَ Who are you? The reply was, أَنَا سَادِسُكُمْ تَحْتَ الْكِسَاءِ It was Jibra'il telling Imam al Hussein to leave. I am the sixth one that is under the kisa. Imam al Hussein, as he is leaving Mecca, they came to him. Many people, they tried to stop him. One of them was Abdullah bin Abbas. He came to him. He tells him, Ya Aba Abdullah, you will be killed if you go. Yazid is a tyrant, he will kill you if you go. Imam al Hussein replied, Ya ibn Abbas, Shah Allah and Yaradi Qatila, Allah has destined that I become a martyr for the sake of this religion. And then he tells him, Then if you know you're going to be killed, why are you taking the women and the children with you? He replied, Ya ibn Abbas, Shah Allah and Yarahunna Sabaya. Allah has destined that they become prisoners of war so that the message of Aba Abdullah can reach all of the world. Imam al Hussein, as he is leaving, he has a cameleer with him, someone who leads the way, a navigator. This man by the name of Abdur Imah, he, had, he was holding the camel and leading that holy caravan of Imam al Hussein. And he begins reciting, Ya naqati la tad'ari min zajri, dwamshi bina qabla tulu' al fajri, bi khayr rukban wa khayr sifri. 
أسادت البيض الوجوه الطهري يا مالك النفع معا والضر أيد حسينا سيدي بالنصر He does a dua for Imam Hussein عليه السلام As the caravan is traveling Suddenly the horse of Imam Hussein stops Imam Hussein he changes a horse and then he changes another horse until he realized that this is a stopping point. He asked his companions, Masmu Hadih al Ard, what's the name of this land? They told him Al Ghadriyat. He tells them, Is there another name? They tell him Shat al Furat. Is there another name? They tell him Nainawa. Is there another name? Until one person said Karbala. Imam al Hussein, as soon as he heard the word Karbala, he said, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al Karb wal Bala. Inzilu ha huna mahatur halina. Ha huna tusbani sa. It was one day where Imam Al Hussein arrived to Karbala. The women, they were, they had the men with them. They had Abu Fadl Al Abbas. They had the whole family was together. It was times of difficulty, but they were all together. And there was another day, the day that it was only women and no men to protect the family of Rasulullah, sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات تابع اللهم بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك غافر الخطيئات إنك ماح السيئات إنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم ارزقنا زيارة الحسين وشفاعة الحسين وصلى الله على محمد وآل محمد